Good night, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for this virtual nightlife. It's becoming a habit now, and um, I think it's going to continue. I think it's a good thing because we're going to reach more people than we do when we're just uh, we're just in the building. Um, so welcome to this virtual event. Um, my name is Luis Rocha. I'm the curator of ichthyology at the California Academy of Sciences. Ichthyology is the study of fishes, so I study fish, uh, hence the team tonight, Sharks, and um, hence why I'm here. Um, we have a very special program tonight. Um, we call it, we passionately call it Sharktoberfest. It's been running for 10 years. Um, so usually in October, uh, maybe August, September, October, November, they're the sharkiest months in California. And we celebrate the arrival of the sharks, the migration of the sharks that come up from uh, further south to follow the, the warm waters up to the north. Uh, when they come, we celebrate Sharktoberfest, which is a mix in this case of sharks and, and good beer. Um, so the program tonight, as I said, is, is very special. There's lots of exciting things going on. Um, we've been celebrating Sharktoberfest for 10 years. Um, I've been at the Academy for nine years and I had the pleasure to be in um, I think five or six are these events. Uh, so whenever I'm not traveling, I am uh, uh, on the public floor doing nightlife, real face-to-face -face nightlife, um, talking about sharks. Um, tonight, um, it makes it um, even more special because we have uh, we've teamed up with Fort Point Beer Company. Um, this is going to be our first ever virtual beer tasting. I already jumped the gun here and I'm already tasting mine, which is excellent, by the way. Uh, so throughout the evening, we'll be, uh, we'll be uh, tasting several different types of beer. Um, uh, Fort Point's head brewer, Mike Schne by Mike Schnebeck, will be here. I'm sure I butchered his name. He'll probably tell the right way to say it in a little bit, but he'll be here with us um, uh, to lead us through the, uh, the beer tastings. Uh, the first one will be Physio, Cool, and then Animal. Um, as a reminder, um, tonight's program is live, is live, so I want to ask our presenters to introduce themselves um, a little bit um, and, and, and talk about yourself a little bit. Um, the first speaker tonight um, is going to be Melissa Christina Marcus. She's a friend of mine. We've met a while ago. The last time I uh, uh, saw her was in Malaysia 
in a marine conservation conference in Malaysia. So Melissa is a regular in um, uh, Shark Week. She's been in a couple of programs in Shark Week. I'm sure you, you saw her being bitten by a, a crocodile in one of the programs that she was a part of. Um, she's also a PhD candidate for um, Curtin University. She's an excellent science communicator, science writer. She writes beautiful science um, uh, communication pieces for Forbes and other outlets out there. Um, she's writing a book and she's going to be streaming um, live from Western Australia. So without further ado, I want to hand it off to Melissa. much for that introduction. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what sharks have taught me about not only themselves, but also about life. Um, but like Louis said, let me tell you a little bit about myself first. Uh, so I am a Latina marine biologist. I was born in Puerto Rico and I grew up in Mexico and kind of all over the world because I've moved around quite a bit. Uh, and I study the chondrichthians, which are the sharks, the skates, the rays, and the chimeras, that whole entire group there. Um, and I'm currently based in Perth, Western Australia, working on my PhD, which is looking at habitat use of sharks, so figuring out why they are where they are, uh, but also looking at our relationship with wildlife, um, specifically predators such as sharks. Uh, how are perception of these animals has changed over time and what these attitudes toward sharks means for their conservation success or failure. And the first time I got to meet a shark was when I was about 14 or 15 years old, learning how to scuba dive in the British Virgin Islands. And I was so ecstatic. I mean, it was a nurse shark, like the one that you see pictured here. And through the regulator, I was just like, oh my God, it's a shark, it's a shark. Did everyone see the shark? And I popped up and I still had that same exact energy and people were like, is, is she okay or is she afraid? And very quickly they realized, no, I was very, very excited. And that still is me today when it comes to sharks is me being like in the regulator, just, did you see the shark? Yeah, yeah everyone saw the shark? Okay. So I'm very, very passionate about sharks. Uh, and I learned that they can actually teach me quite a lot of lessons, not only about themselves and their biology and their behavior, but also about life in general. And so I learned a really valuable lesson that day when I first encountered that shark, and it was the beauty of being. Um, so this is personally one of the biggest challenges and the hardest lessons that I've actually had to implement in my life. And I'm sure I'm not the only one to struggle with this. Um, today, more than ever, we're valued on what we are doing rather than who we are, and we take pride in our never-ending to-do lists. Um, whereas animals, on the contrary, don't keep these lists. So when I scuba dive, I have nothing else in mind. It forces me to be fully present, very much like this oceanic white tip that you see here. The oceanic white tip is very much present. It is looking for food. It is not thinking about social media follower has or what it's going to do later on that night. It is right now focusing on what it's doing. Um, and for me, that's a wonderful lesson. I think something that we can all kind of learn about is just sitting there and watching them be sharks, no hidden agendas. Um, and yeah, they've definitely taught me a lot about life such as patience. Uh, so in a world uh, where our patience is very short, the Wobegon sharks definitely should get an award for patience. They are camouflaged like the ocean floor and they light and wait lie and wait for a meal to kind of come and then snatch as you kind of see in this gif do um, into their mouth the meal goes. So in a world where we get impatient because logging onto our computer takes too long or we have to wait in a queue or a line, how we say in America, um, we could all really learn a lesson about patience from the woebegone shark as well as networking or working with the right people. So an unusual hunting strategy was actually discovered not too long ago um, among gray reef sharks that you see here in the Fakarava Atoll. I might have totally just Missed that up. Sorry, it's early morning and I haven't had my coffee yet. <laughs> um, but these gray reef sharks actually tended to follow foraging uh, white tip sharks. That I don't think there's any in this photo right now. Um, but they're basically they're they're a little bit more of like a flattened looking shark than these uh, typical looking sharky sharks. Um, and they essentially attempted to capture any of the fishes that the white tips chased out of the reef. So they're not exactly cooperating when it comes 
to hunting, but it shows that the gray reef sharks know who to follow. And while you may not actively hunt with your friends, you can kind of take an idea from this sort of hunting strategy by relying on a network of support and interchanging ideas with other people, which is a great way to help you grow. You know, you can do a ton of networking um, in the world, and it's not just in your own specific field, it's around the world in different fields as well, which is really, really important. And while you can do all the networking in the world, working with the right people, luck sometimes has you going both ways. So sometimes the shark, like this tiger shark here, trying to have an albatross chick, um, is lucky and it catches its intended prey as you see at the end of this gif. Um, but sometimes it gets a mouthful of seawater or sand. So no matter how hard you work, there will always be some good luck and some bad luck. The only question is, how will you respond? Will you sulk and think, oh, why me? Or are you gonna bounce back, find a way to persevere and take this quote unquote failure as a learning opportunity, as a way to grow and better yourself. And of course, learn something from it. And with that kind of comes adaptability. So I think while the saying is do or die, I think adapt or die is probably more appropriate. It's a sign of willingness to learn from situations. Um, and the epaulet shark is a great example of this. Um, not only, it lives in the tides. And so when the tides recede in that tidal area, it has to get up and actually move to other little tide pools in order for it to survive. Um, and so it has adapted, it has evolved to having these pectoral fins, these side fins to actually help it move or walk as you can kind of see it do um, from tide to tide. And with adaptability comes curiosity. Um, sharks are very curious sometimes about their surroundings. And as you can tell, they don't really know the concept of personal space. And curiosity is one of the best traits that you can have in a shark, but also in life and in science. It means you're gonna start asking good questions and good questions show you care and you want to learn and you wanna better yourself. So don't be afraid to try new things like this blue shark here. They've also taught me that attitude is everything. They don't second guess themselves, they're sharks. So if you think you can or you can't, you're right. These are just some of the life lessons that sharks have taught me. For example, they've also taught me that you can be strong and graceful and unlike anything that people actually believe you will be, such as this gorgeous whale shark that you see here, covered in like a starry constellation pattern. You can be different like this frilled shark, which looks like something that the Kraken was kind of based out of. It looks like no other shark species, but it is a shark species. You can be creative like the mega mouth shark, which has the top part of its mouth actually glows in the dark in order to attract uh, animals to come into its mouth and essentially be eaten. And you have gotta be don't be afraid to take a bite out of life too you know again it ties into that curiosity and taking chances like this goblin shark here just trying to figure out what the heck this is and taking that chance there is such diversity in these animals which is just another lesson in and of itself to embrace differences each of these animals excel in their own environment and each has their own role which as you can see, it means diversity is critical to excellence. And that's not just true for sciences, but life in general. You might not know that there's actually over 500 different species of sharks, even though you may think of them as just the normal top three, like the tiger sharks, uh, the great white sharks, the bull sharks. There's so much diversity like you've kind of just seen here. Lessons about life. And sharks, plus basking shark can kind of sneak up on you from the most unlikely source. And for me, that was sharks. They've taught me almost everything that I know about life with then my parents kind of verbalizing it. But that's the thing about sharks. You hang around enough of them, you sort of become one. And it isn't a bad thing. They've still got a lot to teach us. It just is a matter of whether or not you're listening. And that's it for me. Hey there, uh, my name is Mike Schneebeck. I am the director of brewing at Fort Point Beer Company and uh, really excited to be here tonight to celebrate Sharktoberfest. Uh, I want to say thank you to the Academy of Science. Um, 
you know, we've done some great events in the past with them and we're really excited to be here virtually with you tonight. So uh, tell you a little bit about Fort Point before we get tasting, if you can hold uh, for just a minute. But uh, Fort Point's the largest independent craft brewery in San Francisco. We've been open uh, going on seven years this December and our brewery is located in Chrissy Field or right off Chrissy Field in the Presidio. Uh, so we're right about 300 yards from the Golden Gate Bridge. So uh, I was doing a little research before this. Um, I, I thought we were the closest brewery to the Farallon Islands, which I know is a very popular shark hangout. But uh, it turns out a few breweries in Pacifica have us beat by just a little bit. But um, hey, if sharks are around and get lost in the gate, they can swing on by for a beer. Anyway, <laughs> um, our goal at Fort Point is to make beers that are balanced, nuanced, and uh, most of all, accessible you know, for everyone. We think that great beer is uh, something everyone should be able to find, whether it's their corner store, their grocery market, um, or even online. So tonight, we're going to be tasting through three beers, uh, two newer ones, and one of our kind of old standbys that's semi-shark related. So I hope everyone was able to grab their beers for tonight, whether it's at your corner store or uh, through our new delivery service at fortpointbeer.com. But uh, we're going to start the night off with... Svizio, our Italian pilsner. I'll just crack this open. I'm going to pour it in a glass. If you don't have a glass, that's fine. Uh, feel free to sniff through the can. Just watch your nose. But uh, here we go. The glass will just give you a little picture of what this beer looks like. And this beer is a really pretty, really pale um, pilsner, which is as they should be. It has a nice big rocky head right there. So uh, getting in the flavors. Um, the main attraction of this beer, of this style, Italian Pilsner, is the aroma. So uh, the style originated in Italy, you know, Italian Pilsner, um, in the early 2000s. So it's a newer style. Um, credit goes to a brewery called Berifico Italiano uh, for kind of coming up with the style. And essentially what this beer is, is a German Pilsner, um, which a lot of people are probably familiar with. You know, simple Pilsner, classic kind of cracker flavor, light hop aroma. But what they do for the Italian Pils is turn that hop aroma up. So we do that by a technique called dry hopping, although it doesn't have to be dry hop, but dry hopping is adding additional hops to the fermenter after the beer's been brewed. Uh, in this process, we're able to extract a lot of aroma, but not a lot of bitterness, uh, which is the other component of beer that the hops provide. So for this recipe, uh, we took a very simple base of Pilsner malt and uh, really dialed up the hop additions, uh, both in the kettle and in the fermenter. And what's unique about this style as well is we're using exclusively um, what are called noble hops. These are kind of the, uh, the old school hop varieties uh, from continental Europe. And these hops typically express flavors of kind of grass, um, hay, some herbal spicy qualities. So it's a little different from some of the flavors you might expect from an IPA, which typically you know, play in like the citrus, tropical fruit, um, those, that kind of realm. And what I really love about this beer is it sort of marries those two styles. So uh, just on the nose, you know, you get kind of light hay, honey, some grassiness. And then flavor-wise, you know, it's really clean. Bitterness is there. There's a slight, like, kind of malt, crackery sweetness at the end. But um, there's this nice herbaceousness through and through the beer, which to me makes it, you know, drink. It's a very elegant beer, but at the same time, a really casual beer uh, that you could have a couple, whether you're in the, in the yard, in the park, just hanging out. Um, so the hops that we're using in this beer, a uh, hop called Hallertau Mittelfru, which is a very classic German hop, and a uh, Slovenian hop, the Styrian Aurora, which provides a little more, uh, a little more character, a little more herbal, eucalyptus, um, you know, those, those kind of edgier flavors. So uh, this beer is very dear to me, I suppose. I mean, I, I like all the beers we make, but this one, I think, culminates this idea of what we call like the craft beer life cycle. You know, where you sort of, your introduction to beer, most people's is, you know, through light beer, domestic beer, like a Coors Light or something. And your first impression is probably like, eh, whatever. But hey, it's college, you're having fun. Um, and if you really get into beer, you get to start to explore other styles. You get into pale ales, maybe a Sierra Nevada. And then you step it up, get into IPAs, bigger stuff. And then maybe you go on from there to sour beers or big bourbon barrel-aged stouts. But uh, we find that through that flavor journey, you start to kind of want to go back to something simple. And uh, Svizio, for me, really checks that box because I, I love IPAs. I love the flavor, the hop flavor, the intensity and aroma. Um, but those are generally bigger beers, higher in alcohol. Svizio 
gives you that same kind of aroma intensity, but a little bit of a different look. You know, it's kind of grassy and herbal versus big tropical, dank, citrus, that kind of stuff. So it still scratches that itch for a fun, aromatic, lively beer. But, you know, it's 4.9%. It's lighter on the palate. It's just really crisp, just goes great with food. It's really like a, a nice anytime beer. Um, so that's kind of that life cycle as you come back. You don't want to go all the way back to maybe the Coors Light or the uh, yeah, super light domestic beer. You want, still want something with flavor, you know, because you've refined your palate a little bit over the years. And so that's why I think a beer like Spezio really uh, has it finds a place um, in people's refrigerators. So uh, that's Spezio. Real quick on the illustration. Um, all of our illustrations on our cans reference um, certain ideas or destinations in San Francisco. Uh, Spezio has a cool kind of a North Beach sort of Italian vibe to it with the Vespa, uh, the Alfresco dining and the uh, sort of Centennial building there. So that's Spezio. Uh, hope you enjoy it. And uh, we'll be back a little later to taste the other two beers. Excellent, Mike. Thank you for the great introduction about Sfizio. I'm glad you talked about the illustration. It was the only thing I was going to ask about. What's the illustration? It's really cool. I like it a lot. And thank you, Melissa, for the great, um, the great shark talk. Um, our next speaker um, is going to be Leo Chen Gaskins. Um, Leo is going to talk about the, uh, the diversity of sharks. He does research on shark diversity, adaptation, and survival. So that's what he's going to be talking about. He's um, marine community ecologist um, at, uh, at Duke University. He has a, a very prestigious NSF grad research fellowship. Um, and uh, he studies a topic that's very important uh, for conservation. Um, he studies the impacts of large predators in ecosystems, in communities. So that allows us conservationists and ecologists in general to predict what's going to happen when we remove those predators from the community. Um, so. Leo, take it away. Hello, everybody. Uh, so thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, so I'm just going to jump right in and introduce myself. So my name is Leo Chan Gaskins. My pronouns are he, him. I'm Asian, I'm openly queer and openly transgender, and I'm a marine ecologist, as Ruth mentioned. Um, so I study ecology, and ecology is understanding the interaction between living organisms and their environment. Specifically, my research looks at how large predatory animals influence coastal environments and how we can use this information to better restore those ecosystems and also conserve the animal populations as well. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about my own research and also some really cool and amazing diverse sharks and the fascinating adaptations that they have for survival. And also I'll tell you more about uh, this picture, which looks like a panic revolt. So uh, the first shark that I actually ever worked with was nurse sharks. And that was really where my love of shark research started. Uh, nurse sharks are really fascinating. They're not really what you might think of when you think of the word shark right away. This is you know, laying on the bottom, uh, but that's important. It's very adaptive actually. They have a cool mouth. They have uh, a suction feeding mouth rather than maybe those great white shark teeth that you might be thinking of. The teeth are actually extremely reduced um, and just there to help crush small things that they suck up from the sand, it's really cool. Uh, the research that I've done with them and what makes them really special, I looked at their metabolism and, and metabolism, the concept of it, uh, when we talk about it with humans, uh, it's sort of similar, but when we think about it with animals, usually we're thinking about it in terms of how many calories does this animal need to take in today to survive? What is the threshold that it needs to meet? Uh, and nurse sharks have this cool adaptation where they can breathe while laying down. So even just sitting still, uh, they can pull water across their gills, which is really important. So some there is sort of a myth that sharks, if they stop swimming, they will die. There's only a few species where that is the case. And some of them happen to be the more famous ones like great white sharks, and that's called land ventilation. But uh, buccal ventilation, which is being able to pull water through while laying down, this allows the sharks to have a very low metabolic rate, which means they don't need to eat a lot of calories per day to survive. So this is cool and adaptive. And it was actually, when we uh, found this out for the paper, it was the lowest metabolic rate that had ever been recorded in a shark. So that was really interesting. So another really cool and diverse shark is a spiny dogfish. And you know, from the name, it doesn't sound like a shark species, uh, but uh, it's really lives up to the name of spiny. So these are only three or four feet long. 
The spine refers to the spine on their dorsal fin. So you can see in the corner of the screen, I have a zoomed in picture of what the spine looks like in front of their top fins. So each of their top fins has one of these. Um, the reason that they have these and the reason they're adaptive is because if you have a larger shark, because these are, are a, a mid-sized shark, um, if it's inside of its mouth, what they can do is arch their back and jab that spine into their potential predator. Um, and that might make them open their mouth and allow it to escape, which would allow it to survive, which is really cool. Um, on top of that, the spines have a mild venom in them. So yes, there are sharks that have venom, which is cool um, as well. So on top, of, that would be very unpleasant if you had a spiny dogfish in your mouth. So uh, just because you're probably thinking it, these are not venomous, venomous enough to kill a human being. Um, it would just be probably pretty unpleasant um, and definitely a hot tip on picking them up. Hands around the dorsal fin, uh, don't put it on top. Uh, so the work that I have done with them uh, actually was in the realm of law. So I was working with an ocean lawyer and besides doing research with sharks hands on, which is really important. Another thing that's really important is creating really strong legislation that protects these animals. And in the case of the spiny dogfish, the biology comes very strongly into that. So having scientists that know about that uh, is really important because these mature at 32 years of age. And by that, I mean, they can only become sexually mature and have babies after 32 years, which is much further than human beings even. And they're also pregnant for up to two years at a time, which I really respect, but that, that only adds an increasing amount of time to the uh, being able to produce young. Um, in some areas, 95% of the population is depleted. It's very hard to replenish the population when it takes that long uh, for that to happen. So uh, yeah, so not only do we need to conserve the animals, but creating strong laws about how many you can take uh, definitely protects us as well. So epaulette sharks, this is another, this is the most recent shark that I've done work with and they are amazing to work with. Uh, most of mentioned that they have a stunning adaptation. Um, and keep in mind, these are very small sharks. They are less than two feet long and they're very skinny. Um, and the cool thing of course, is that they can walk out of water. And this is amazing uh, because this allows them to get between different tide pools and if they get stuck out of water, they can actually survive for hours with no long-term brain damage because they're able to lower their metabolism and shunt blood into important regions of their body, which is super, super cool. So these were absolutely a, a dream to work with, frankly. So my own research of them was in shallow water on the Great Barrier Reef. Um, so we noticed when we walked around this island um, that we kept seeing large numbers of epaulette sharks in extremely shallow water at night. And by shallow water, I'm talking two to six inches of water. I mean, these were practically, like their fins were practically out of the water at some points. Um, so the question was, why are they using these extremely shallow waters at night? Uh, what's kind of the drivers there? And when you do uh, research of sharks, um, or any animals for that matter, uh, you think, when you think of drivers, a big two drivers are, one, are there predators uh, around? Are they in certain areas, are they pushing them? And two, is there food? Are they hungry? Are they coming to this area because they want to eat? So first we looked at the predators and we did surveys in different depths of water around the island uh, to see where they were at. This is a black tip reef shark. Black tip reef sharks are, are fairly abundant in this area um, and they certainly could you know, bother an epaulette shark, uh, along with also lemon sharks and black tip sharks as well. Uh, and we found that these tended to be in quite um, a bit deeper waters, uh, certainly not in two to six inches of water. So you can tell based on the body shape of this black tip reef shark, it would beach itself in water that shallow. They just wouldn't do that and they don't have the same type of adaptation as, as um, epaulette sharks to be able to kind of shimmy back in. Uh, so that would make no sense for them. So in that case, epaulettes being in that shallow water means that they're protected and it's essentially predator free, which is pretty interesting. Okay, so back to this picture that I, I promised to tell more about. So, so this is a sieve that I'm holding. And the reason I'm sieving is sort of like what you use in a sandbox uh, as a kid or some people use a sort of implement for baking, I guess. Um, I would not use this one, but what I was looking for was uh, marine worms that were buried in the sand. So like the nurse sharks that I mentioned earlier, epaulette sharks also can use suction to pull animals out from under the sand as well. They don't really use teeth in the conventional way that we might think of for sharks. So these are polyhete worms, which is a type of marine worm. Um, and so just by using a sieve, we were able to say, okay, you know, worms are here. And you might not think it, but epaulette sharks, their main component of their diet is worms. Um, and yeah, sharks eating worms, that's probably uh, kind of a weird thought, but these things love them, they slip them up like crazy. This is actually their most common prey, and this is crazy, so this is a fireworm. And fireworms, I would not even touch one of these things, they have a toxin 
on the outside of their body and it just burns like hell. It is so uncomfortable to pick these up. And this is a pretty big one. You can see on the ruler uh, next to there in centimeters. Uh, and so relative to the length of epaulette shark's body, the fact that they are slurping up these just fiery noodle worms is just mind blowing and super metal and badass. And the other thing they eat actually is this very thin little clear strands. I have it kind of circled on the side of the photo here because they're hard to see. Uh, and these are called spaghetti worms. I mean, who can resist spaghetti? Um, so we did, uh, after doing surveys for each of these three worms in the shallow waters, we found that each of them were certainly present and some of them actually quite abundant. So we kind of concluded that they're not only uh, based on our surveys, are epaulette sharks pretty um, abundant in very shallow uh, waters around the island at night, uh, that it, perhaps they're being driven in by predators and also uh, by food. Uh, which is pretty cool. And that was a really fun study to run. So before we go, I'm gonna just talk uh, rapid fire, go through a few other really cool and diverse sharks that live out there in the world. And the first of those is the chain cat shark. And you think, oh, that's really pretty. It has a great uh, pattern on it, uh, but it has a little secret, and which is that it's bioluminescent. So these live really, are biofluorescent. Uh, these can live deeper than 2000 feet. Um, so being able uh, to potentially signal others with biofluorescence is really, uh, really fascinating, cool adaptation. Another um, shark that you might not expect to actually be a shark is the large tooth sawfish. And these are huge, they can reach over 20 feet. And I'm sure that you're looking at their um, amazing nose, which has teeth on the side of it, uh, which is also called a, a rostrum. And they actually use this to get food, but in a way that I didn't expect until I even saw it myself. And so they're using it to stun this fish um, until it, it, they just, suck it up with their mouth, which is underneath their body. And very much last but not least is the shy shark. So the puff adder shy shark, these are found off of South Africa. They're very small. They're also less than two feet. Um, and something that I absolutely think is amazing is that their adaptation is that if they feel scared or threatened, they curl up into a little donut shape and they stick their tail over top of their eyes, uh, which I think is amazing. And I, sometimes I feel it. So, uh, they definitely certainly earned their name. So in conclusion, these are all the sharks that we talked about today. And there's so much more diversity to sharks than is portrayed in the news, on Shark Week, or movies. And I believe all shark species should be treated with respect and love. They're just amazing animals. I feel completely honored to be able to work, and work with them and research them. Um, and I hope that you learned something new today. And it was an absolute pleasure to talk to you guys. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Leo. That was pretty incredible. Soft tooth shark is wild. Um, I had a question come in about water and where we get our water at Fort Point, uh, which is a good question because we are one of the few breweries in the world to have a, a very unique water source. So in the Presidio, uh, we get our water from Lobos Creek. And Lobos Creek is, comes up through an aquifer right around Lake and 13th Avenue. Um, if you've ever been to Baker Beach and see that kind of water that runs out to the beach, that is the terminus of uh, Lobos Creek. So uh, our water comes from there. Uh, for the majority, the majority of our water comes from there. Uh, the reason being, you know, back when the Presidio was a military base, they had to have a protected water source, so they set up that infrastructure, and it still exists today. So uh, the majority of our water comes from there. It's supplemented from time to time uh, with Hetch Hetchy and groundwater from San Francisco. Uh, but the majority of it is from Lobos Creek. And when we first started the brewery, that was a big concern of mine. Uh, so obviously water is a huge component of beer. And, uh, you know, there was some question whether or not it was going to be good water. And it turned out to be very suitable for brewing. So we don't have to do too much adjusting. And it gives us, you know, I think a, a unique character. A lot of the classic beer styles, pale ales, um, pilsners especially, rely on their unique water source uh, to really define that style. So uh, thank you for the question on water. Uh, our next beer we're going to talk about is Cool. This is our cold fermented India Pale Ale. Give it a quick pour so you can see. Again, nice and pale, uh, clear, white, rocky foam. So uh, this is a good sort of pairing, I think, for, for Leah's presentation on, adap on adaptation because uh, that's what makes this beer unique, uh, the fact that it's cold fermented. So IPAs are ales, 
<clears throat> and typically ales are fermented with strains of yeast that prefer warmer temperatures. Uh, the two distinctions between lagers and ales, big one is the, the preference for temperature of each yeast strain. Uh, so in brewing, you know, we need to pay close attention to the temperature of fermentation because we want to create a predictable, repeatable environment for the yeast so that our beers are consistent. Because um, the temperature does a lot to influence the way the yeast metabolizes sugars, the way it behaves, and the flavor compounds that it generates during fermentation. Um, in the natural world, you know, yeast are adaptable. Yeast exist uh, everywhere. Orchards are everywhere. Um, and they're going through their biological processes, you know, really independent of the weather. Um, but for brewers, and the way yeast is marketed to us, um, yeast companies say, give us a, a specific strain of yeast and say, hey, this performs great at 68 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Because this is, you know, where we've seen repeatability. Um, this is the temperature range we think that you should use in order to get the best results. And so most brewers follow along to that. Uh, but the reality is, you know, these yeasts are, they're, they're from out in the world. And, uh, you know, if they have cold days, they have hot days. And uh, just like us, they behave differently um, based on their environment. So what we did with Cool is we took our, our house ale yeast, uh, which is 001. Uh, it's very popular yeast used in like Sierra Nevada pale ale. It's very clean ale yeast. But our, our sort of hypothesis was, let's take this yeast that prefers warmer temperatures, typically 68 degrees Fahrenheit, and let's just push it out of its comfort zone a little bit. Let's push it down to say 56, 58, and see how it reacts. And uh, that experiment was really interesting. And we found that it fermented just fine. Um, we know it can do it out in the world, so why not do it in the tank? And uh, what, what turns out is that it's just, it changes its expression of flavor. So what is a really neutral, yeast otherwise around 68, you do it a little lower, um, we found that it accentuated some of the citrus hop characteristics, uh, the hop aromas in the beer, and really created kind of a nice smoothness, which is, is a characteristic of colder fermentations in general. But uh, the ability to push this ale yeast out of its comfort zone, I think, and uh, you know, find just new flavors that we can coax out of it is something that's really exciting to us because beer is composed typically of malt, um, hops, yeast, and water, right? So those are the four levers we're really pulling. There's lots of varieties of hops. There's lots of varieties of malt. Uh, there's different strains of yeast, but uh, it's really interesting to see what you can do with a single strain and just how process influencing its environment can really create some really um, interesting and ideally tasty flavors. So getting into cool, um, you know, what I think really stands out about this beer is just this really clean, bright, citrusy, uh, there's a hint of tropical flavor, but really clean citrus hop aroma. Um, the hops we're using in this beer are three hops, Strata, Equinot, and Citra. Strata is a, a newer variety developed by Oregon State University, and uh, it's becoming pretty popular. Yeah, it has a really cool pineapple, kind of cannabis, dank, really rich aroma. Um, Citra is probably a very popular hop if you're in IPAs, or a very well-known hop, I should say. Uh, just like the name implies, grapefruit, tangerine, citrus, some passion fruit. And uh, Equinox a bit of a wild card, can get a little peppery, uh, but also have a little bit of stone fruit, a little bit of tropical fruit in there as well. So cool, we like, it's an IPA in terms of the hop flavor, the hop intensity, but it drinks really smoothly. Uh, and that's accentuated by adding some wheat, some oats to the grain bill that helps smooth things out. But we really think that lower temperature fermentation um, is what gives it that defining characteristic. So real quick on the illustrations of Cool, this is sort of our ode to San Francisco. Uh, we think it's a pretty cool city to be a part of. And, you know, we were thinking of what, what exactly makes San Francisco unique. And one of the things that really came to mind is just uh, the walkability, the ease of exploring San Francisco, and all of the sort of unique methods of transit that you'll find, you know, on a cool afternoon it's really easy to just take a walk from one city, side of the city to the other. And you're going up and down stairs, you're on streetcars, you're on bikes, you're on Muni. And we tried to capture that idea of transportation and exploration in this can illustration here. Uh, all right, so that's cool. I uh, hope you're enjoying it. And we'll be back with Animal in just a bit. Great. Thanks again, Mike. 
Good stuff. Here it is. Cool. I'm going to have some. So um, I was super excited about the next um, the next talk by David Maguire. David Maguire is um, one of our uh, regulars here at the uh, Tractoberfest events. I think he's here every year, um, if not like every other year for sure. He's a, a definitely a regular. He's, he leads Shark Stewards. Shark Stewards is a Bay Area nonprofit uh, organization dedicated to uh, saving sharks, basically shark conservation. Um, they do excellent, excellent work. And um, every year, um, Dave comes and, and does really great presentations about demystifying the, the, the fear of sharks most of the time. He talks about how we shouldn't be fearful of, uh, of sharks. Uh, he's on a boat right now in Southern California. And he was going to try to do his presentation live via Wi-Fi on the boat, but the Wi-Fi on the boat wasn't that great. So he um, he sent us a video instead. So we have we have a video of him um, explaining what Shark Stewards is and 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 talking a little bit about his his work with shark uh, conservation. And then right after him, uh, Bianca Bauman is going to talk about shark tagging, which is what I'm showing there in the picture right there. So I am um, not a shark biologist, but I did do some work with sharks. Um, I helped um, a little bit of uh, uh, tagging for, with my friends. Uh, so that's a team that uh, I, I was a part of when we, I was in Hawaii. Uh, we did a lot of shark tagging there. I never worked on the data itself, but I always went out and helped. And I took that picture. So I always like taking the pictures. I let them do the work and then I jumped in the water. And uh, and take the picture, but shark tagging, which is what uh, Bianca is going to talk about right after uh, David's uh, video, is a, a fantastic tool that allows us to uh, know uh, how and and where to sharks move, um, and with that information we can make much better informed conservation um, decisions. Um, so without going too much detail and leaving more for David and Bianca, take it away. Hi, my name is David McGuire. I am the director of the nonprofit Shark Stewards and a research associate at the California Academy of Sciences, where I do a little bit of field work and some filmmaking as well, and education during the Shark Sharktoberfest activities. So happy Sharktoberfest. I wanna take you on a little journey because I'm about ready to go on a voyage to Panama via mini marine protected areas and reserves and areas that are currently being fished for sharks and other large fish, we believe. So we're about ready to depart Sausalito. I'm on the boat now. Doesn't look like it's moving much. Looks like I'm underwater with one of my favorite sharks. But we are going to be en route, and you can follow us on Instagram as well as our column on National Geographic Field Notes. So I'm gonna share my screen and show some slides and take you on a little bit of a voyage and tell you why we celebrate sharks, right? So let's just go to the slideshow. Slideshow. So we are part of the Earth Island Institute based in Berkeley and you can contact me at that email below. We are an education, science and conservation organization applying research towards policy. I'm a diver, I am a scientist. Uh, I'm also a filmmaker and writer for National Geographic. And one of my first films was Shark Stewards of the Reef, which we entered into the San Francisco International Ocean Film Festival. This year was our 17th virtually. And uh, we show films on the ocean of all kinds of subjects from sailing to surfing, to whales, to science, to animation. I encourage you to join us next year, hopefully in the flesh and not virtually. So why do we call it Sharktoberfest? Because we're celebrating the return of the white sharks to our national marine sanctuary after an incredible migration of almost 5,000 miles round trip. My colleague, Bianca Bauman, will tell you a little bit about how we know that and what else is going out there and what we call the white shark cafe. But every fall right about now, we celebrate the return of these big sharks to our sanctuaries where we're out there eating those nice fat elephant seals at the Farallon Islands and Año Nuevo and other rocky outcrops where there are breeding areas of these pinnipeds. 
but we have a huge diversity of sharks in the ocean and in our own ocean from the filter feeders to the silky sharks down in the Galapagos and Cocos Island, thresher sharks that occur off our coast as well as pelagically. Unfortunately, these sharks are encountering tens of thousands of long lines set mainly for tuna, but are killing millions of sharks. Increasingly, these sharks are being taken for their fins for shark fin soup. So Shark Stewards introduces data and policy and uses your passion and advocacy to introduce shark protection policies, both in California, in the US, and internationally. Because sharks are missing, uh, Global Fin Print just did a study that showed 20% of reef sharks are absent from reef coral reefs where they previously existed. Uh, all large marine macrofauna are at risk, but particularly sharks. And with the current rate of extinction, sharks face an extinction rate of 19% of their existing species with the associated ecosystem services and habitat loss of almost half, 44%. We are seeing poaching during COVID in our marine reserves. This is the Galapagos. These dots represent ships that are fishing the line, it's called. Uh, primarily, these are uh, Chinese flag vessels, over 300, that are also turning off their beacons, entering the Galapagos that you see the island, and also Cocos Island at the top, and Malpelo in this swimway that hammerheads as well as sea turtles are living in and migrating in between these islands. So you can see these different lights where ships have gone into these protected areas and they're fishing sharks, primarily for their fins, but as well as their meat. So we're on our way down to document this, to make a film, to expose it through writing, to share these stories with you at the California Academy of Sciences and our partners. Dive, and I hope you follow us. Uh, you can follow us on Instagram. Our entire journey will be documented. Some will be live and I'll be writing articles for my field notes column with the National Geographic Society. So thank you. Happy Sharktober. Enjoy Sharktober Fest because what could be better than a nice Fort Point IPA on my computer? <laughs> and sharks. So thanks for listening and thanks for my sponsors. And I'll see you next Sharktober in the flash or sooner. So I'm signing off, enjoy your night, thank you. All right. So thank you, uh, pre-recorded David McGuire. <laughs> um, hi, I am Bianca Bauman. I'm a mission manager at Sail Drone Inc. We are based in Alameda, California. We design and manufacture wind and solar powered autonomous surface vehicles called sail drones, pictured here in our signature bright orange. And we are striving to build the world's largest high resolution ocean data set, working with government and private companies around the globe. And tonight, I'm thrilled to share with you our partnership with the team of scientists that led the journey to the White Shark Cafe. And also, I'm thrilled to share a little personal tie uh, to the White Shark Cafe, as prior to Sail Drone, I worked under the lead scientist and worked very closely with the tags that were put on these animals. But more on the technical side and uh, and so forth, not the shark biology side. <laughs> so in 2018, Saildrome participated in a month long multidisciplinary mission that included researchers representing five institutions and a combination of traditional and cutting edge technology to track tagged white sharks to the White Shark Cafe. The mission was led by uh, Dr. Barbara Block down at Stanford University as well as scientists aboard uh, the Schmidt Ocean Institute's research, research vessel, vessel Falcor. And for decades, the team of scientists based out of Stanford and Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute have been looking at the migratory patterns of these animals. And with the breakthrough of tagging technology, the white sharks have led 
the team to a surprise in the middle of the Pacific Ocean between Baja, California and Hawaii called the White Shark Cafe as seen here in this map. Those are tagging, um, those are tagging data points um, and the red circular area is what is known as the White Shark Cafe. So Dr. Barbara Block and her team at the Monterey Bay Aquarium have found that a large number of white sharks arrive to our coast every fall, which is why we celebrate Sharktober, similar to what David said. And they feed on fatty rich diet of elephant seals, sea lions for roughly three to four months and then migrate to this open patch of water. And so the team of scientists were really interested and quite perplexed as why they leave this highly productive caloric coast, expend so much energy to swim thousands of kilometers away to a remote oceanic desert. Are they mating or are they feeding? So using 20 years of tag data, the researchers have discovered that when the sharks arrive to the cafe, they move quickly up and down the water column, exhibiting a completely different behavior when they are here at the California coast. The sharks display a rapid oscillatory dive behavior, diving many times per day. The tag data elucidated that the sharks tend to dive in regular intervals as well. And through these observations, this led the team to hypothesize why. Why are the sharks exhibiting a different behavior out there than they are here? Are they searching for food in these layers? Because it seems the data is elucidating that they are in a particular depth in the ocean's water column. So observing their behavior in the cafe is quite difficult as you may imagine. <laughs> and not just because of the remote location, but also observing what is occurring underneath the surface. So oceanographic conditions, the chemistry, the biology, and the physics. And in order to further elucidate what is attracting the sharks to this layer, the scientists prepared planning their expedition to the White Shark Cafe. So now it was time to prepare for the expedition. And in November, 2017, 37 tags were deployed on the, on the sharks here in the California coast. The tags automatically released during the expedition, so they're pre-programmed. And the goal was to retrieve as many tags as possible out there at the cafe, because this will triple the amount of data. So think of the tag sort of like a black box on an airplane. You have a tag pinging at some resolution from California to the White Shark Cafe, at some resolution via satellite, but actually retrieving that tag, you obtain a lot more information, higher resolution, second by second data. And the team were successful and through a lot of modeling and mathematics, they were able to predict more or less where the, where the tags were. And so they retrieved 10, 11 of 22 retrievable tags. And so partnering up with Schmidt Ocean Institute, Monterey Bay Aquarium Institute, Woods Hole, Sail Drone, and other institutes, the team began preparing for the expedition. And in April 2018, the team embarked on an expedition to the cafe to find out why. Why are, the, why are they out there? And uh, pictured here, we've got our sail drone to the right. Um, this The sail drone um, is equipped with sonar to detect the deep scattering layer. Uh, this is important for uh, bi uh, locating biomass. Uh, we have sensors measuring salinity, sea surface temperature, chlorophyll, which are great indicator indicators of ocean productivity and biological productivity, as well as autonomous underwater gliders, and so forth. <clears throat> so the researchers discovered some very interesting species residing in these waters. There were different densities of biomass in that water column. Dr. Barbara Block and her team uh, discovered a whole new world of species that populated by bioluminescence lanternfish and other species 
that have evolved amazing adaptations to darkness. The scientists discovered hidden communities of species, including bioluminescent lanternfish, uh, tiny phytoplankton, fish, squid, jellies, and these uniquely abundant mass, masses of fish draw all kinds of predators like cookie cutter sharks, which have evolved light emitting organs called photophores on the underside of their bodies that act, that act to prey like uh, invisible cloaks. And so the white sharks aren't the only large predators tra tracking the midwater creatures. There are squid eating big eye tuna, blue, and mako, shark, uh, mako sharks um, that also frequent these waters. So this concluded that the midwater layer is super important for the white sharks. But the team of scientists still, the questions remain, why are they out there? Why are they out there? Are they mating? or are they feeding? So while it's believed that the sharks ventured down to the darkness to hunt for larger fish drawn by bioluminescence, the team of scientists haven't been able to explain another behavior they observed only in male sharks. The, they observed that the males would each travel in a V-shaped pattern as many, as many as 140 times per day. And it's unclear if the behavior is related to mating or if it's hunting for different species of fish. So the scientists hope to gain some clarity after analyzing the data that is collected. And so I'd like to end on two notes here. Um, I wanted to, uh, one, mention that uh, thanks to uh, the work of Dr. Barbara Block and her team, as well as Mission Blue and other organizations, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, as you know, as UNESCO, and the IUCN identified the White Shark Cafe as a potential World Heritage Site, recognizing the unique importance of the region for white shark biology. And lastly, I wanted to thank Shark Stewards, David McGuire, uh, Cal Academy, uh, for having me tonight, and uh, as well as Stanford uh, University, Dr. Barbara Block's team, Sail Drone, and Bari, and Schmidt Ocean Institute. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, so you all ready to taste some beers? All right. Next up is Animal. <laughs> yeah, run to the fridge. Uh, so Animal is our tropical IPA, as shown here. And uh, I'll just talk quickly about the illustrations here. This one's kind of a fun San Francisco-themed one. Again, they all are, but I like this one a lot. Um, so we have a picture of these parrots of Coit Tower of Lombard Street. So extremely San Francisco. And the name Animal is sort of a reference to one of our other beers. Uh, it's an IPA called Villager, which you know we build as a very easy, mild IPA, um, named after the kind of idea of the different neighborhoods of San Francisco being little villages. Um, Villager being the beer for the folks in San Francisco. But Animal is the feral, rowdier, rougher, more intense version of Villager. And uh, really takes its lead from a hop called Vic Secret which is grown in Australia. And uh, that hop has some really in, really intense, pronounced tropical flavors, a lot of pineapple. Um, so that's what you're seeing really leading the aroma of this beer. And Louise, maybe you can talk a little bit about sharks and, and the way they perceive senses. Because um, this beer in particular, I think is, it's, it's very, it's got a ton of aroma, um, a lot of really cool tropical flavors. And there's a lot of compounds, um, hop oils, terpenes, esters going in, reacting with one another as they hit your nose to create those sensations. So I'm curious, how do sharks, how would a shark perceive the animal? They, they don't have great sense of taste, I can tell you that. They have a great sense of smell. Um, they have um, a, a sense that we don't have, which is they can sense electric fields. So the, the hammerhead sharks, for example, they have those that big head with the wide, the eyes very, very far from one another, but behind the, under the, the big head, 
they have a lot of electro sensors and they can they can sense fish under the sand so there's a lot of fish that go under the sand to sleep at night because they think they're safe but then the hammerheads they swim right above it and they can they can sense where the fish are just by the, the electricity the, the electrical field from the fish and then they dig it up and they eat the fish so they have great electrical senses they have great smell um, but they do not have a great sense of taste um, they do have taste buds. They have taste buds inside their mouths. They're all over the mouth. Um, some most species of shark they don't have a tongue, so um, <laughs> they don't. They can't have the the same kind of taste that we do. Um, but they um, um, they do have a great sense of smell, and uh, uh, they can sense electrical fields that we don't. I was I was reading that sense of smell. I mean, they're able to pick up like. I think to the parts per million of blood in the water. Yeah. 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 It's incredible. And they use that to, to locate prey basically. So uh -huh. if there's a tiny amount of blood, they, they, they swim in the direction where the concentration gets bigger, gets larger. And then they, they eventually find the source. Yeah. That's really interesting. Cause a lot of the compounds that we're smelling in this beer in animal in particular, um, you know, are perceptible and really, really small thresholds. There's one, uh, ethyl hexanoate, uh, which smells like fresh cut pineapple, which I'm pretty sure is present in this hop, Nick's Secret, but it's perceptible to humans at like 1.5 ppb, you know, which right. is a really small fraction. Um, right. And then there's others like diacetyl, which is a bad flavor, right? It's like kind of a buttered popcorn. It's a, it's a defect you don't want in your beer most often. <laughs> but people's perception of that can vary. So some people are really sensitive to it and others aren't. So the beers, everyone at home, you know, the beer you're drinking, we are all perceiving this beer in a different way. So while I say there's pineapple, there's tropical, there's cannabis, what have you, if you don't smell that, that don't worry, that's, there's nothing wrong with you. Because <laughs> um, we, we're all tasting these in a different way, which is it's kind of one of the fun things about beer. And um, that's something that's good to remember, you know, when, when judging beers. Nice. So yeah, what, what are your thoughts on this one? I love it. You know, I, I really I like it. it. It's it's it tastes very tropical. I like tropical things. I'm a I'm a tropical beast. <laughs> <laughs> Good to hear. Cool. Well, yeah, that that's animal. I hope everyone at home uh, has enjoyed the three beers and. So I'm I'm really fascinated with the illustrations in the cans. Yeah. Do you have a Do you have an artist that does that for you guys, or or is is it just someone someone somebody's hobby or? Yeah, no, they're we, really we, good. And I like this one. Can you explain that one too for us? Yeah, yeah. So we work with a local company, uh, Manual Creative. Uh, nice. And uh, as well as our uh, create, excuse me, uh, creative director, Dina Dobkin. Um, she partnered with them and really helped develop all the illustrations, all the concepts, the visual concepts of the beer. And I think that's something that really sets our beer apart and something we're really proud of. And we put a lot of time into, you know, back for the first year and a half, we didn't can just because we wanted to take the time to develop kind of these concepts and get something we really liked. And so, um, yeah, they all feature this kind of uh, fort point lockup that's reminiscent of the uh, trusses on the Golden Gate Bridge, you know, which is right by our home here. But um, in there, you'll see different illustrations. They all kind of tie back into San Francisco. And we try and go after illustrations that are kind of uh, you know, not, not super obvious, but stuff if you live here, you know about. Um, kind of similar to Fort Point. It's not top of the list on the, in the travel books, but I think people that, that live in San Francisco, you know, yeah, you can walk down there. It's a surf spot. Uh, you know, it's this cool little local spot. So with the illustrations on animal, um, you know, we spent a long time trying to find the right animal. And uh, you know, we were looking at the bison. Uh, there's, yeah, bison in, Buff in uh, Golden Gate Park, um, seals. Uh, raccoons, but uh, settled on these parrots of Telegraph Hill, you know, which is, is a really unique story. Right? This kind of flock of uh, domestic turned wild parrots that torture the people of North Beach and Telegraph Hill. <laughs> um, and so they are the animal illustration. And then in the middle panel is Lombard Street, nice. Kirby Street, and then uh, Coit Tower. Nice. So I, I yeah, really like this band. It's very simple. Yeah. I have a couple of questions for you, Bianca. One, do you like the beer? And two, how long do those sail drones collect data? Because they're like autonomous, right? They go out and collect data. How long do they stay out collecting data before they have to come back to download everything? 
Yeah, so that's a great question. Well, first, I love this bear. I would say um, this 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 will, animal and Spezio are were one of my favorites um, tonight. And uh, and yes, to answer your question, Louise. So uh, the really great thing about the autonomous vehicle that sail drone is that they can sail for over a hundred days. How we do missions over a hundred days, um, more than that, two hundred days. So um, they sail back to either Alameda or we pick them up in a, a location during COVID. It, not so much because it's been hard to travel, but um, usually Hawaii is a really great place that we deploy and re recover or uh, Alaska, the Atlantic. Yeah, we've deployed in Faraday and um, yeah, so the capability nice. is pretty great. Yeah, and, great. and similar to the tag, tagging, uh, concept um, when we're collecting data it's you know via satellite um, and then when the drones get back we then uh, upload the high resolution data so all the archival data is stored within the drone which is great nice good a question for you Mike um, here at the Academy was hmm really affected by COVID. We've been closed for more than 200 days now. Um, how does that, how has COVID affected you guys? I'm, I'm, I know that I'm buying more beer now than I was before, so. <laughs> yeah, no, it's been really difficult. I think when, yeah. when it first happened, you know, we unfortunately had to make some like tough decisions just to mm -hmm. get the company in a, I mean, yeah. a couple of the regulations, you know, the company shrank really, really quickly. I mean, right. That was really tough. Um, so, you know, we've been able to keep the production going just, you know, in accordance uh, with the guidelines and uh, just recently have been able to open some of our tap rooms in a limited capacity. So nice. things are getting better. I think, you know, we were fortunate that we had our beer in cans. Uh, mm -hmm. People's purchasing shifted from bars, keg beer mm -hmm. to stores and cans. And we were fortunate enough to have that, you know, already that, that sort of infrastructure already exists. So. Uh, selling a lot of cans uh which is great but uh, you know we're, we're a smaller team than we were back in march so right same with us yeah yeah hopefully we go back to what we were yeah, yeah definitely definitely all right well uh that's animal yeah, yeah. cheers Any other questions it. or i think we have some performances yeah, let me check the comments here, see if there's any questions. Everyone wants to try the beer. <laughs> uh, somebody's commenting on your or jar, your jar, Bianca. I also drink, I mean, I'm not drinking out of a jar here, but mm -hmm. I, I have a jar in my office and I, I drink usually out of a jar in the office too i'm like infamous for my jars i eat out of like pickle jars olive jars <laughs> at work. people are always like <laughs> yeah okay all right we're gonna we're gonna keep going um i have a video queued up here to show everybody and then we're gonna have a musical guest right after so let me show you the video um We've gotten a few questions about um, my work with sharks. And I don't work directly with sharks, but I encounter sharks all the time. And this is one of the most interesting shark encounters I've ever had. This is in St. Paul's Rocks. It's a tiny group of islands in Brazil, in the middle of the Atlantic, between Brazil and Africa. And uh, um, it's one of the most memorable and funniest shark encounters I've ever had. So I'm going to roll a video here and hopefully I mean, if you put your sound up you can hear the sound behind it so this is our team doing our deep diving if you follow us on social media anywhere you know that we do those deep dives with the rebreather that's the big thing in the back there and um, all of the extra tanks that's because we're at 450 feet there and this 
gigantic six gear shark comes up from the deep to check us out. And if you hear the, the chipmunk voice in the background there is Meridius Bell, he's our dive safety officer. And he's telling me, look at the shark, look at the shark. He's, we breathe helium at those depths. He's trying to catch Hudson's attention there. Hudson, Hudson. Hudson looks at Meridius and is like, yeah, yeah. So what makes this super special, super memorable is because neither Hudson, so the, the shark swam right over our heads. Neither Hudson nor I saw the shark. The only person that saw the shark in this dive was Meridius, the guy that was behind the camera. So Hudson and I there, we did not see the shark. We were completely distracted. And there is a there is an excuse. The excuse is that instead of seeing the shark, we were distracted with this little animal here. So that's the that's the, the organisms I mostly work with. Small fish that live close to the reef. And this is one of the most spectacular fish I've ever seen. Um, um, again, collected at 450 feet in St. Paul's Rocks in Brazil. We, we named it Tosanoides Aphrodite. So we named it after the Greek god is Aphrodite because it hypnotized us and, and we ignored the shark um, while we were, uh, we were catching it. So that's your funny story, funny shark story for the night. Um, and then next we have a musical performance. Um, oh, I wish we were live in the building for this, um, maybe in a few weeks. And Christina, we'll talk about it before we close uh, the programming tonight. We are reopening, um, but before we reopen, uh, before we reopen, we still have one or two more of those virtual events. And tonight we have a very special musical guest, um, Damani Rhodes. He's a pianist, composer, percussionist, I mean, you name it, and super, super talented. And um, we're going to have a great time. So stick around. The money, take it away. Well, first, I just I just want to say shout out to Virtual Nightlife for even having me. I'm really glad to be here to do a performance. This performance is not like live, but I did record a performance for you guys uh, with me and my band that's playing with me. And as I said, I'm a musician, I'm a composer. And this past February, right before the pandemic struck, I was fortunate enough to uh, go to DC and be a part of this residency thing that happens at the Kennedy Center called Office Hours. And what it is, is they have this new building called The Reach, and it's a beautiful new building. And they have these studios inside where they invite artists to come and they give them this space and they just tell you to create. So here I was with uh, one friend of mine who played drums on the recording and all I asked was for a drum kit in the room. And we get to the room and there's a drum set there. The, the windows, the walls are like almost floor to ceiling glass. The Potomac River is right outside the window. And there's a baby grand piano in the room as well. And so they had their technicians mic up the piano, we mic'd up the drum kit. I brought up my laptop computer and a small MIDI controller. And for five days, we made music and I ended up with a project coming from there and I titled the project Reach uh, from that time at the Kennedy Center. It was a really, really magical time. It was really incredible to be able to just work on music and just be creative and have nothing else to do. Like usually we have something else to do, but I didn't have anything else to do but to work on some music, which was amazing. And shout out to the Kennedy Center for that. And recently uh, I released a single uh, in July called Manana. It's, like the word manana in Spanish meaning tomorrow, but I changed the spelling. Uh, but you can find that on Spotify, you can find it on Apple Music everywhere. And it's featuring the Grammy Award winning trumpet player, Keon Harold, uh, which was really cool. I was able to get him to join in on this project and for that song. And the performance that I'm doing today uh, that I'm gonna show for you guys is that performance. i me playing the song manana that you can you know find on all of the uh, streaming platforms. And of course, I do have an album that's coming out November 6th. Well, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but I want to get into the performance so you guys can enjoy the music. And um, I'll be in the comments with you guys. So enjoy the song, Manana.
Yo, thank you guys for checking it out. I hope you guys enjoyed the song. I believe they posted in the comments where you can find the song on Bandcamp. It's also on the streaming platforms. But I also want to let you guys know that I have the entire project, the Reach project that's going to be coming out November 6th. And one of the best ways to stay updated and stay in contact with me right now is on my Instagram. You can follow me at Damani31. It's on the screen. Or it was on the screen when I was performing. No, it's still on the screen. At Damani31. Follow me uh, there on Instagram. You can find me on Facebook with the same URL, facebook.com forward slash Damani31. And um, I post content there regularly, and I will be soon opening up an email list. So those of you who want to stay in contact with me will be able to stay in contact. We do text messages, the whole nine, whatever method is best for you so you guys can stay updated on uh, what I have going on, the music that I'll be releasing. And hopefully when you guys open up with Virtual Nightlife, I will have an opportunity to play live for you guys. That'd be so much fun. Again, though, thank you so much for having me on tonight. I've really enjoyed the show, all the shark stuff, the deep dive. I have some diving stories myself. I haven't gone deep diving, but I've gone snorkeling, and I'd love to talk with you guys more about that. But um, I enjoyed the show, the beer tasting, the whole nine. But thank you guys again for having me, and um, I look forward to hanging with you guys again one day. Thank you, everybody. Thanks all the speakers for, for being here. Um, Melissa, Leo, David, Bianca, Mike, all of the beer, fantastic. And Damani, great, great performance. Thank you so much. Um, this is it. I think we are done for the night. Um, hope you had a good time. And uh, Christina is going to talk about the exciting reopening of the um. economy, right? Yeah, we're, we're, you kind of spilled the beans, Louise. But um, oh, yeah, no. No, hopefully people have heard already. <laughs> um, thanks, Louise, so much for hosting tonight. Um, I hope everybody noticed your shark shirt. I know you were worried that tiny, tiny sharks. That people wouldn't be able to see it, but <laughs> here you go. Um, yeah, thanks so much. Have a good night, Louise. Um, yeah, but as Louise mentioned, um, we are here. If you don't know us, um, we're kind of the producers and programmers behind Nightlife, Virtual Nightlife. And um, But yeah, we just announced this week that the Academy is finally reopening. Um, and we're, we're so excited to reopen our doors after about seven months of this. So um, we're going to be reopening to members first on October 13th and then to the general public starting on October 23rd. And um, we always, you know, like end these programs saying thank you so much for watching and thanks so much for supporting us during this time. And just, we just want to say extra thank you to all the members and anyone who donated anything. Like we really, we wouldn't be reopening um, without you. So if you want to make um, reservations to come visit us, you can go to calacademy.org slash reopening to read everything about that. And Nightlife won't be back in person just yet. We're working on it, uh, but we'll be here, me and Christina, we'll be here virtually with you for uh, at least all of October. Um, starting with next week, we'll be back with Night School. Night School is going to Chile. Um, here, we're gonna learn about Chile's long history of astronomical discovery. Um, Here's some of the coolest discoveries in Chile. Um, and then also go behind the scenes of our newest planetarium show, Big Astronomy, uh, which explores the world-class telescopes, observatories, and the people, of course, um, of the astro astro astronomy capital of the world. Messed that up a little. Um, but we'll be back next week and for the rest of October. So thanks for joining us tonight, um, and we'll see you soon. Thanks so much, everybody. Good night.